Hello, welcome back to Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. In this set of videos, we've talked about how natural selection is a mathematical inevitability. We've talked about how there's variation in the acceptance of the truth of evolution across various countries and some of the reasons for that. We've talked a little bit about evidence for evolution and common ancestry of species. I'll recap that in just a second. So in this video, what I'd like to do is respond to some of the criticisms of evolutionary theory that are leveled particularly by the media and by non-scientists. So first, to recap, again, some of the points we've already raised, is we've seen examples of natural selection in real time. I talked with you, for example, about the case of the peppered moth and the change in its color over time in Great Britain and in other parts of the world. We've also seen the same sort of thing with respect to antibiotic, antibiotic resistance, resistance in, in various, various bacteria. bacteria. We talked about extensive evidence for evolution and common ancestry in the fossil record. We've talked about cases of vestigial organs. These are organs which don't have a function in present day species in the ones that you're looking at. However, other modern species or their ancestors presumably had functions associated with this. We've talked about vestigial genes which are very similar to vestigial organs, except we're just looking at the genes producing these. We've talked about evidence from biogeography, where animals live or where plants live, being consistent with this idea of common ancestry and evolution. And finally, I talked briefly about a case of inefficient design, something that if you were to actually design an animal from scratch, it wouldn't really make sense. However, when we consider its ancestors and this working with the materials available, it made a lot more sense. So some of you may be thinking, well, are there any observations that actually would falsify evolution? The answer is yes, there are a few. So one of them would be fossils in the wrong place. I mentioned to you before the, the famous quote from J.B.S. Haldane about uh, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian would certainly falsify the truth of evolution and uh, common descent of species, common ancestry of species. Um, ma mammals in the Devonian would do the same. Adaptations in one species that are only good for a second species. The, that would definitely not be consistent with the idea of evolution by natural selection. Adaptations that could not have evolved in a step-by-step -step process, those are things that, again, would be very difficult to reconcile with evolution by natural selection. And I'll show you a proposed case of that in just a second and show you why it's not the case. Evolved altruistic behaviors among non-relatives in animals that don't exhibit social behavior. Again, that would be a challenge for evolution by natural selection. And last but not least, any sort of discords, any disagreement between relationships or phylogenies inferred using DNA versus inferred using morphology and fossils. Again, we don't really see those, but those are observations that could, in theory, falsify uh, common ancestry or evolution by natural selection. So let's talk about what some of the common criticisms are that are leveled in the media. And this is particularly true in the United States. First is that there's been too much change for evolution to explain. You, know, you frequently hear people say, I'm perfectly okay with microevolution, you know, change within a species, small bits of change like the color in the peppered moth. But common ancestry, we have a common ancestry with bacteria or amoebae or plants? No way! There's just too much change. We'll talk about this in a second. You can't explain the complexity we see. So the, uh, one example you, pre you frequently hear is that of uh, the eye. The eye is too complex and half an eye doesn't work. Well, it's true, half an eye doesn't work, but that's not how evolution would have made the eye. It wouldn't have made one half and then the other half. <laughs> uh, one that's come up is, why isn't it still happening? So uh, Republican strategist Christine O'Donnell here in the United States said, why aren't monkeys still evolving into humans? We don't see these half-human, half-monkeys out there, obviously. Yeah, we'll come back to that. And last but not least, that it doesn't explain life's origin or denies the existence of God. We'll come back to each of these points. So first, let's talk about the too much change argument. Now, it's very difficult to conceive of time in the context of the age of the Earth. And I think this is where the challenge comes in and when people say, well, there's been too much change. There's no way you can have that much change. Well, let's look at some things where we do know the history of what's happened. So let's look at dogs. Dogs experienced artificial selection through our human breeding. There's no fundamental difference genetically in terms of what happens with artificial selection versus natural selection. It's just one case when we apply it versus another case where, you know, the environment applies over competition or something like that. Dogs were domesticated only a few thousand years ago. Okay, so this is not a very long period of time. 
the breeds that we in fact see today, so things like the Great Dane, Chihuahua, Collies, all those, all those great things, most of those are only a few hundred years old. Yet we see striking diversity. We actually see different forms, as you see from this picture here. They're forms that look like they barely could even interbreed. They don't even necessarily look like the same species. So this is a fairly dramatic change over the course of a few hundred years. Now, how old is the Earth? Well, the Earth is on the order of, the Earth is like five billion years, but life has been on Earth for an estimated three and a half billion years. Well, it's hard to relate to this number. Like if I tell you something like something happened 3,000 years ago, you say, okay, that was a long time ago. If I say something happened three billion years ago, you say, okay, that was a long time ago. But it's hard to relate to the difference in scale there between those two things because it's so much longer than human lifetimes. So let, let me put this in sort of a scale that we actually can relate to. How many times over could dog breeds have evolved? How many times over and over again could dog breeds have evolved? Well, if a thousand years were a millimeter, three and a half billion years would be 3.5 kilometers. So look at, look at something like pull up a ruler for a second and look at it and you'll see, okay, that's one millimeter. So that would have been dog breed. That would have been another, that would have been all the dog breeds. That would have been all the dog breeds. Do that over and over again for every millimeter and do that until you've gone three and a half kilometers down the road. <laughs> that's a very, very, very long time. You could have dog breed, you could have evolved dog breeds over and over again, many, many, many times. So just to give you some scale, here's uh, Manhattan, one of the boroughs of New York. There's three and a half kilometers. Imagine counting that off a millimeter at a time. So really, I think the issue is that we can't conceive of the scale of time. And that's why people are very um, unwilling to accept the idea that you could get so much change. It's because we just can't conceive of the scale that we're talking about. Another criticism is this idea of too much complexity. And you, you often hear the things that say, you often hear people saying, well, that we don't see intermediates to eyes. Well, in fact, even the single-celled organism here, the euglena, as an eye spot photoreceptor. A simple photoreceptor is probably the, what was the first step into evolving what we see as the modern eye. The figure I show here on the slide depicts a series of events, starting with a simple photoreceptor with a nerve associated with it, up to the modern eye. And this is very, very easy to conceive of as having happened. So this shows you how the, something as complex as the eye could evolve through these simple steps, not involving a half eye or anything ridiculous like that. So let's talk briefly about why isn't this still happening? Well, this is, there's a lot of incorrect assumptions with this argument. First, one of the assumptions is the formation of new species means the old species will be gone. That's absolutely not true. The second is this presumed directionality of evolution. Why should monkeys still be evolving into humans? Uh, there's a lot of problems with this. So let's go into several of them. First, new forms may be advantageous because they're exploiting different uh, resources. So I have here a picture of several Darwin's finches. These are some of the finches that inspired Darwin for his theory. Uh, the top one here is, uh, top left one is Geospiza magnorostris. It's a woody seed eater, among other things. One next to it is a cactus eater. Below it's an insect eater. Below that is a grub eater. So we see these, these different forms are exploiting all sorts of different resources. Now, presumably there was some ancient finch which actually got to uh, the Galapagos and, and diversified into all these different forms but it was advantageous to go into all these different new resources. So it helps to have all the forms, right? Like there's an advantage to each of them, okay? So the, it's advantageous because they can't exploit these distinct resources. The other thing, as I mentioned, is there's no directionality of evolution. History may not repeat itself. The late Stephen Jay Gould often used the analogy saying, if you were to rewind the tape of life and play it again, would it actually unfold the same way? The answer is it may or may not. In a lot of cases, it may not. We may get something completely different. But there's a very crucial point, with, particularly with respect to this idea of man from monkeys. And that is humans did not evolve from chimpanzees or amoebae or anything else that is currently alive. Instead, this is a very important point, humans and all these other species share a common ancestor. Then we go back in time, there was a common ancestor, and we have these modern species coming from it. All species, even single-celled ones, have changed over time. They have evolved over time. The amoeba has evolved over just as much time as the humans have. Just because if you go all the way back, we share that single same common ancestor. So there are no higher beings. This is a misrepresentation to think of it as we're higher and they are lower. 
There are definitely cases of simpler versus more complex, but there's no higher versus lower. There's no more evolved versus less evolved because the time frame is the same. So the last thing I want to touch on very briefly, because this comes up a lot, this idea that uh, evolution doesn't explain life's origin or denies the existence of God. Now, the first point is somewhat true, that when we look at most evolutionary theory and most of the things we'll be talking about in this course, don't attempt to address how or why life arose. We're talking about how it's changed over time from the original life forms or from later life forms to the modern day life forms. So that's not something looking at that original origin of life. There are people who, choose, who do try to understand that, but that's not where most evolutionary theory comes in. That doesn't mean it's bad or mistaken, it's just that's not what we're focusing on. The second part is untrue. There's no intrinsic theism or atheism to anything we've discussed or to anything about evolution. As you've seen before with the example I gave you with the, the squirrels and natural selection, it's a mathematical inevitability. It's only explaining what's happened. It's not saying anything about there is a God, there's not a God. And in fact, there are some biologists who support evolution who are also very devout in their faith. So one example being Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health at, uh, in the United States. Some of them, in contrast, are very devout atheists, such as Richard Dawkins, who's very outspoken about his atheism. There's nothing within evolutionary theory that speaks whatsoever to this idea of God or not God. There's nothing in that. And I will point out, there are some faiths, however, that are adversarial towards evolution, where, there's, where there are uh, dogmas which come out saying that, no, uh, man was created in its modern form, things like that. That is not an issue with evolution. That is an issue with the faith failing to accept it. So it's using arguments outside the realm of science. So it's up to you how you wish to evaluate those. But if you want some other materials to look at, I encourage you to see an interview with Jerry Coyne, which is, which is found online. Uh, he's the author of the book, Why Evolution is True. He's a very outspoken advocate for evolution and very eloquent in the way he presents things. So I encourage you to look at that, and I hope you've enjoyed these videos so far. Thank you.